how they've added all of these other zones. I can remove zones. Uh, the public is set as the default. You can see right there. I could change that if I want. If I wanted to, I could create a new zone. Uh, typically, a DMZ zone, I would only be using that if I were using my Linux box as a, a border firewall, not just a host firewall. And then any, any um, public servers that I had attached to the DMZ interface would be in the DMZ zone. And then I would have the public and the and the uh, private or internal. Um, you could think of external and public as being the same. Uh, so I'm going to just go down to public. Now, this is kind of one of the nice things that they have uh, done. This is a change in the interface. So, for example, if I were running Apache, I could just add it. You know, assuming I'm running it in SSL, uh, allowing the DHCP v6 client is not a bad idea. Um, you know, but you see all of these different options. It's not an exhaustive list. It's it's pretty large, but it it doesn't list every. Um, server service that you might want to use so for example if you wanted people to you probably wouldn't be doing that on a public interface but if you wanted people to attach via samba samba makes a linux box look like a windows server then you would want to add that if the firewall's on uh, ssh if you wanted people logging in securely you could add that You know, fairly simple uh, kind of setup here. They also took out a couple of things that they used to have. They, they used to have something in here that made it really easy to set this up as, as an internet sharing box if you wanted to set this up as a border firewall. Of course, most people are doing that in hardware these days with either uh, an appliance firewall or uh, a NAT router, wireless router, you know, something along those lines. You know, there's a lot fewer um, software border boxes than there once were. Once upon a time, uh, having a server be at the border running some sort of firewall software and uh, so on was really, really common. And that's kind of unusual these days. So maybe that's why the the extra stuff that used to be here to uh, easily set up your Linux box as a border uh, firewall is uh, not so obvious. I'd have to read a new how-to. In the older version of the firewall, it was actually really, really easy. It was only one thing you needed to do outside the firewall. You had to go into the network settings and and allow something. And other than that, you did it, everything was right in here, and it was really simple. Um, unfortunately, that's not quite you know as simple as it used to be. At least not at a quick glance. Uh, but again, you know, it's not essential the way it was. Say. 15 years ago, you saw a lot of border firewall machines were some sort of server running firewall software and it had multiple NICs in it. And you don't see that so much these days. So if you wanted to enable a service that isn't listed, you would go over here to ports and just type in, let's say, 
I had Macs that I wanted to connect. Apple file protocol is port 548. So there's a TCP port. Um, and let's just say I accept all of these. If we go back in and look. Come on. If we go back in and look. We should see. Oh, I'm getting two of them now because I wasn't patient. Yes, we didn't want that one. So if I go to ports, you can see the 548 is there. There is a little help here. And they give you examples. You can put a range of ports in with a dash, or you can separate individual ports with a comma. I believe this, the space is essential if you're specifying individual ports. And if you're using the dash, there's no space with a dash. It's just ports dash, you know, in this case, 16.001 through 16.009. Um, but as I recall, the space with the comma after the comma is essential. Um, so it's pretty simple, you know, and remember everything in Linux, in, in SUSE Linux, is uh, one stop shopping in Yast. You know, if you go to software, You know, you can go to online update, software management. You can add software repositories. You can get information about your hardware, add your printers, you configure a scanner, configure your sound setup, uh, the keyboard layout. And there's partitioning tools, uh, the sysconfig editor, the bootloader. So uh, the bootloader is what will allow the OS to be loaded from the, the boot sector. You usually, if you're dual booting, then you're normally uh, replacing, if you're dual booting with Windows, you're normally replacing the Windows bootloader with a Linux bootloader, and the Linux bootloader can point to Windows. Services Manager allows you to control what's started on startup. Um, date and time is fairly self-explanatory. Kernel settings, you don't want to do anything here unless you really know what you're doing. <laughs> um, network settings, you there's all kinds of things you can configure related to the network. These days, Linux um, defaults to using a network manager, but you could change that to using the traditional if up, which is... Uh, well, I'm going to show that because that would be recommended if you're, it says it's being handled by network manager, which is fine. Um, so you can enable IPv6 right there. If you were running this as a, a server, server with a static IP address, you might not want to use the network manager server. You might want to do more traditional. Um, there's an overview that shows you that, you know, that it's getting DHCP. Um, if we were not using network manager, we could edit it. You can set your host name. There's a default host name from the install. Uh, and you can customize your routing table here. And that, so that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, you can configure system wide fonts. Uh, directory server, that would be doing an LDAP server. You know, this is where you can control all of your server services. If this is um, 
populated with a manager, but the actual server service isn't installed, what it would prompt you to do would be to install the server service for the management tool that you have here. And so that's kind of handy that it's going to tell you, oh, you need to make a modification uh, and you need to install the service if you want to configure it. App Armor, so the, in the security and users, we might take a look at that later on in the class. It's a, it's a security feature that you can apply things by application. Uh, it's kind of cool. It also can create problems if it's misconfigured. Uh, I've had things come with app armor settings turned on that uh, I had things not working because of whatever was turned on in app armor and I had to go in and change the app armor settings to get them to work. Um, the security center, you can go through and do some hardening of your OS. You can configure who you use sudo. Sudo is super user do. So um, people that can run super user commands, uh, you can set that up as to who can do what, which is kind of cool. And this is where you can go to add your users and groups if you were managing multiple users on the system. You can take file system snapshots, that's kind of cool. You can look at your system logs. I actually usually look at the system logs in terminal, but you can do it here. Um, I haven't used this systemd journal, so I can't really comment on what that is. And then if you had specialized drivers for Linux, uh, you can use that. So uh, any questions about this? It's pretty simple and straightforward, I think. And it's really handy that it's all in one place. Uh, not all Linux distros do that. It's one of the things that I really like about SUSE. Some people in the Linux world hate Yast. I I love Yast. Oh, Tucker, you have a hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. It was just a question that kind of got um, uh, passed up. Uh, it was about the um, the block zone. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was looking at it in my um, virtual machine, and it doesn't change the uh, description text. Block is blocked, right? I would think so. That's new in uh, – that's fairly recent. So I haven't delved into the block zone. I'm going to hop back to the firewall. Let's take a look at it. Um, security and users – You know, essentially, in any of these zones, if it's not allowed, then it should be blocked. And so, uh, I'm so not I sure what the purpose of this why they have this zone called block. Um, unless the idea, you know, you can specify that a NIC is in a particular zone or you can enable a particular zone. If you wanted everything blocked by default, maybe that's why they have that. Um, I'm not sure. As I, I said earlier, typically, um, in older versions of the firewall, you had three zones, the public, um, either home or internal, and the DMZ. You know, the drop zone, that wasn't there. I mean, typically if you, in other types of firewalls, you know, you can specify that like pings can be dropped you know, so it just doesn't respond to a ping. But why they call it a drop zone, um, if I go on help here. It, 
Yeah, so. We can change the zone right here. So if I wanted it to be in the public zone, for example. So I'm assuming the in you know they created the block zone so that you could have everything be blocked. Um, so you could have all of these set up. To me, it, it kind of adds layers of confusion to have them in here by default. I'm actually not real excited about this. Um, I would be more excited about, you know, having it be clear, oh, we have, you know, if you're, you could change it to your home zone and have particular rules where in the home zone, let's say you wanted to allow everything in the home zone. And I'm going to move it back in. Come on. You can do this. There you go. Um, so there's the home zone. Oh, I added all, but it didn't stick. Why not? Did I say, I, didn't I say accept, not abort? Accept. Come on. Today, thank you. There we go. I must have hit abort by accident earlier. So the internal is different, public's different. Not much is trusted in the trusted zone. That's kind of funny. <laughs> So that way, you know, so I think that the purpose of this, this is just my best guess without doing a little more looking into the background. I was, uh, you know, I didn't really look too much at the firewall because I've used it for years and the interface hasn't really changed very much. And then I opened it today and I was like, oh, look at that. The interface has changed. Um. So what I'm thinking is that they have these different zones set up so that, you know, if you're on a laptop, you can go to the interfaces. Oh, that's, look at that, it didn't change my zone. That's interesting. Um, you can go to the interfaces and change which zone you're in. So if you want it to be in the home zone, says home. Oh, I guess that's right. I had said abort, not accept. You know, and I could do a public thing, uh, um, a customized thing here. So I have the all of these set up different ways, depending upon where I am. You know, you don't need all of these if you're not on a mobile device. If it's a if it's not a laptop and you only have one NIC, you could delete them all except for one and just set up how you want the firewall just to eliminate confusion. I believe, you know, I think they set up this block zone so that if you wanted to, if you're traveling, you know, when you're in a internet cafe, um, you can just block everything. I'm not sure what the difference is between block and drop because from here, the configuration looks identical. There's nothing allowed. And in the block, there's nothing allowed. So that having these two seems redundant. And to me, having home and internal also seems redundant. I can see having a home and a work where they're both internal, but they might you might want different rules for a home as opposed to work. Um, 
you know, and typically, um, unless in, in the public zone, you know, if I were running some these services and I want people to access them, then this is I'd probably I might turn this off if I'm using a static address. If I were running these servers, this is probably what I would allow in the public zone. You know, you do have to have a way, especially if people are going to be adding data to the web server and they're adding it externally to the network and not internally to the network. They need to have a way of doing transfer and default FTP is not secure. And there is a secure file transfer inside of SSH where everything's encrypted. Rather than setting up a certificate in FTP, I would just use SFTP, which is a subset of SSH, um, as opposed to FTPS, which is um, FTP with secure sockets layer. It's just a lot more work to set up. And then you would, you know, if it's public, then you would need to have a signed certificate. And uh, seems to me like a hassle when SSH is encrypts everything and you can set up SSH to do key share so that there's, you could not allow um, password logins. You could just say that's not allowed and um, generate um, a public key that you would hand out to the client or if it's for yourself, if you're logging into the server, have an account on the server, you could ge generate you know a key pair and then give yourself the public key for the machine that is um, going to be logging into the server. And through that shared key pair, when you connect, it sees that you have the key in your storage and you're in. So you just transfer the file. There's no username and password to, because you have the key, um, which is pretty cool. So, you know, if I were running a public server, you know, where I was doing web and people needed to um, transfer data that because they're, that they're creating for the web server and they're not on the private side of the network, then then I would enable SSH on the public side. Uh, if if this were sitting in a DMZ, you know, I would. I would probably be running rules off of a different box uh, and I would allow SSH from the private side of the network to the DMZ, but I might not allow it from the public side of the network to the DMZ. Um, or you could, you know, if you had multiple NICs in the box where, you know, there was one NIC that was connected on the DMZ side or to the private side and one connected to the public side, um, you could have different rules for the Knicks and you could even not allow certain traffic to go out, which is kind of cool. But are there any, does that clarify that? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, that clarifies it. Yeah, I think that they just set these zones up you know, when when I first opened it, it was like, huh, they get a lot more zones. What's that all about? Um, hmm. Uh, that that seems like um, it's just to allow you to set up different settings and then put it in. Uh, I'm just going to look at something here. More. Oh, there's a bunch of chats. Something weird going on with audio. Probably my audio. Okay. Let's fix. So anything we type in the ports is allowed through the firewall? Yes.
Um, were we uh, covering any specific part of the homework right now, or is this just working with the uh, firewall and uh, Yast in general? Um, is this is you know the the one of the firewall you know a lot of people are familiar with the Windows firewall and may not be mm -hmm. as familiar with the interface for the Linux firewall. Okay. And so that's that's why I wanted to show the Linux firewall, and. Um, Yeah, anything that's allowed is, you know, if you say a service is allowed, regardless of what the zone is titled, it's allowed. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat to because there was some questions that I was missing. Uh, uh, the shell version of the firewall that Robert showed. I haven't had a chance to look at his post. I uh, I responded. I think the last time I responded to homework was Thursday because I was gone for the weekend, and then I've uh, I had to be out last night and the night before as well. So, um, I'm not without knowing exactly what it was that Robert showed. Um, was he possibly doing um? You know, you can do YAST inside of Terminal. So let me, uh, maybe this is what he was showing. Yeah, I'm getting the warning about almost out of time. No, I don't want to upgrade right now. Um, sudo YAST. I just looked at his post and it is yast in the shell. Yeah, so security and users come over here, firewall. And then it's the same kind of thing, it's just a text mode version. So you're going to use arrow keys and the tab key to navigate. So if I wanted to look at the public, for example, it's uh, not quite as elegant as, uh, as the full GUI version. But if you're, um, if you're doing an SSH in, this uh it works you know and it's uh fairly convenient to use it does take a little bit of getting used to uh having not having the mouse and i'm going to do an alt r to abort yes and i'm going to do an alt q to quit so um yeah that's all you have to do to get in there is type yast in the command line and that'll give you a, a text mode version of yast okay uh, are there any other questions? So, it, you know, if you are, um, wondering about, you know, if you were wondering about the, the Linux firewall, um, you know, that it, I actually like the change in how you enable services to allow. They have the list on the left and you can click on the right. It used to be uh, a little more cumbersome where there was a drop down menu and you would have to select in the drop down menu and then say allow rather than just having the big list. And so that that's an improvement in the firewall, I think. Um, having all those extra defaults, I think is a little confusing if you, haven't been around firewalls a lot, you can be like, well, what's that all about? 
Um, so that's that's a little disappointing that they've done it that way. But, you know, somebody thought it was a good idea and it made its way in. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions, whether or not it's related to firewall or anything else? So tomorrow I will um, kind of catch up on everybody's posts. Uh, as I said, the last time I was in, I think it was Thursday, and I I answered everybody that by the time that I had logged in anyway, before I left town. And I know that there are some that have piled up since I came back, um, but I'll I'll get all caught up tomorrow. And if you have any other questions, certainly feel free to shoot me an email. If you don't have any questions, um, I think we can call it a night. Are we good? I think we're good. Thank you very much. All right. Have a great night. You as well.